welcome to the call. I'm excited about today's event. It's a very interesting topic. You know, when we were sitting down and we were thinking about what, what are we going to talk about? And I think the word kill came up and it wasn't who we're going to kill, it's what we're going to kill. So if you've got someone in mind, just keep that to yourself. If you've got something in mind, we're going to be talking a lot about what do you need to kill to grow your business. Look, the, the main reason I'm excited about today is I think for most of us, and I see a lot of familiar faces on the call, we've been in business for a while. Who's been in business for over five years? Can I just get a show of hands? Stick your hand up if you've been going for five years. You're already in a minority because statistically, 80% of businesses don't make it past the first five. And if who's been in business 10 or more, can I get those ones? Yeah, so you're in 4%. So most of the things that end up dying during this sort of pressure in the economy is business. businesses get closed and we see it everywhere. And, and I think right now there's a cleansing that people need to do within their own business. And it's about what do I need to eliminate? What do I need to stop doing so that I can be more profitable, so I can be more productive, so I can survive this economy and not only survive it, so I can tighten things down so I've got profit so that I can lead myself into the future. So just for those who I haven't met before, my name is David Guest. I run a business called Outcomes Business Group. We started in 2001, which means we had our 20 year celebration in lockdown, right? And I know a lot of people having their second birthday in lockdown because I'm hearing it a lot. Our vision, and Peter Sandel's on the call, he helped us to evolve this a few years back, reinvigorating the business dream. And he asked me the question, what's your purpose? What do you do? Because, you know, we are a business coaching firm and it's pretty boring and sometimes it's almost negative. But what I realized is the reason that I do what I do is because I watch too many people in business that started off with fantastic dreams, freedom, lifestyle choices, all these sorts of things. And they end up getting smashed by the economy, smashed by the government, smashed by their competitors, and they lose the urge to grow. And they live in this world of I'm unemployable now, I run my own business, and it is what it is. And anyone who's heard that term, that probably agitates me the most out of all terms. It is what it is. Because it ain't what it is. It is what you make it. So for us, reinvigorating the business dream is about getting the energy back into you about why you went into business in the first place. So today, we're going to talk about a few things. But just to give you a bit of a framework, you'll notice behind me is what's stopping you. All right, that's up on our wall here. And the reason that's up on our wall is because most of the time, it's not what you need to do that stops you being successful. It's what gets in the way of you doing what you need to do. And there's a couple of reasons. So most of the businesses we see look like this. They're busy. Who's, who's quite busy in their business? Can I just get a show of hands for the busy people? At least half the people on this call. Because every time I ask people about how's business, they go, we're flat out, we're busy. And to me, that's a sort of non-answer because being busy doesn't tell me anything. Right? All it tells me is you're running around in circles, potentially. And the business is not busyness, right? It's not about being busy, it's about being effective. So when we look at, when we actually look at what they do in their day, most of their time is spent in operations. There's a little bit of admin they usually do on the side, sometimes after hours, and their marketing and sales is minimal. And when we ask them why, and they say, we get most of our work from word of mouth or referral. Who, who on this call gets most of their work through word of mouth or referral? Get another show of hands on that one. All right, we've got about half. It's interesting, right? Because when people get there, and I expect you to get a lot of work from word of mouth or referral, don't get me wrong. But one of the reasons that we don't market our business is fundamentally, if we're already busy and we look at investing time and money in marketing and selling new people into our business, the big threat is that we're going to end up working harder. And so when we talk to people about scaling or growing their business and they say, I'm already busy, but I'd like to get a few more clients or I'd like to get more profitable clients, there's not this conflict of interest. So the real issue is that they're stuck working in the business. The ideal business needs to look a bit more like this. Operations, admin, sales and marketing are equal. They're equal. And here's the big distinction. The business owner needs to get out of the way. What sometimes the business owner needs to kill is their addiction to busyness. What sometimes the business owner needs to kill is the thing that the whole business relies on them being there every day. Now, it's a mindset shift. For some people, they go, but I love what I do. And that's a justification to me, and that's okay. But accept the fact that it's very difficult to scale a business when you're in the center of the universe. So we're going to be talking about three things today. And today's I'm pretty excited about today's presentation because all three of us have got a very unique message. So the three aspects that we're going to talk about, which areas you need to kill, the first one's going to be marketing. Now, the issue with marketing is that we are in a world of noise. There's more channels than ever for people to advertise, promote their business. We absorb more information now than we ever did. So we've got Ben Hirons who's going to be talking about what do you need to kill to actually get better traction with your marketing. Then we're going to move into the next stage because it's one thing to actually be effective at marketing. 
The next thing that we need to be looking about is your what do you need to kill to be effective at sales? Now, the reason I bring that up is because a lot of us spend too much time with unqualified leads. We're talking to the wrong people and we're asking the wrong questions. And by doing that, we're actually investing time with people who are not paying us. Because the only time that you actually make money is when someone gives you money, you get paid. And so we need to make sure that we're efficient in our marketing, efficient in our sales. And the last one we're going to talk about is operations. So the last one is operations. And we're literally talking about how do I get myself out of the way? Because for me, if I'm not scaling my operations, if I'm not creating a space where I can sell people into, I will not invest in my marketing and I will not invest in my sales. And so I end up with a flywheel that's lopsided. Okay, so three areas that we need to focus on, marketing, sales, and operations. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our first presenter. So for those who don't know Ben, Ben's going to wave his hands frantically in the air. Is that frantic? It's about as frantic as Ben. There you go. That's him. So Ben, ben runs a company called, he's going to have to remind me, it's called uh, True North. June North. June North. Thank you. June North. Now, the thing that inspired me about Ben is that he is one of those marketers who understands that it's not about how much marketing you do, it's about how effective your marketing is. So he's going to be explaining a lot around how to become more effective with your marketing strategy and so that we can work out exactly what you need to kill. So let's hand over to Ben and let's give him a nice warm welcome. Hi guys, uh, Ben Hirons, yeah, my business is, is Do North. Been in business since 2003 in different formats. So we started out in, in the world of payments. So we basically took Commonwealth Bank's transactional banking products, put our logo on them and sold them to small business and started that when I was 25, 26. And it was really cut my teeth on, on all things marketing and sales. You name it, we did it. Uh, at our peak, we had 20 people in a call center. We had 30 field staff. We were doing 100,000 mail outs and fax outs a month. Uh, you, you name it, the marketing and sales, we've done it. So I guess it was really over that 18-year journey, so I guess some real highlights of, of learnings that I've got. But obviously, I think these are, are three core things of, that uh, I think are at the forefront of all great marketing. And it, ultimately, this theme of it's time to kill things is it's one of my favorites. And it's, it pops up across the board in, in a lot of things you look or learn or read and people you meet. About two years ago in 2019, September, I was lucky enough to attend a strategy business and leadership um, conference in, in Auckland. It was 50 business owners from out the AP, guest speakers from the US, Europe, et cetera. And there's a guy there called Warren Russ. who's really talking about personal leadership. And, and the core takeaway that I took from him was he goes, in order to become the person you want to be, you've got to kill the You've got to kill the parts of the person you are today to get there. And business is no different. It's that concept of what got you here now will not get you to where you want to go. So that means you've either got to start doing different things, you've got to do more of the right things, but ultimately you've also got to stop doing the wrong things that aren't adding material value to who you are and where you're at in your business's journey. I was lucky enough in 2018 to start working with a performance coach, a business coach by the name of Emily and worked with her for, for probably two years. And she was awesome just in terms of pushing me and guiding me and and um, helping me along my journey. And a couple of months into the process, she said, well, what are you most unhappy with with your business? We're just not getting to where I want it to go. So was, there's a few ins and outs there as everybody's journey, but it was two years into the due north journey and it really wasn't growing the way I wanted it to. Um, and she said, right, yeah, let's go. Homework task is to choose your top three competitors and that are more successful than you. Go and analyze and come back with, with ideas as to why you think they're more successful than you. And I think there's a, a great exercise for you all that I'd, I'd challenge you is to most of us, or 99% of us have, um, businesses that are more successful than us that are competitors so uh, go out and start to analyze why that's the case and so i sort of i went through everything uh, the ins and outs we did a lot of market research you know competitor shopping uh, customer interviews all that sort of jazz and came back with uh, about four concepts that i thought they were doing better than us in uh, but ultimately none of them were really material in 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 the impact they were making on it and i took emily through these core points and she, she looked at me and she goes Honey, so she's that Dolly Parton meets Oprah sort of personality. So she goes, honey, it's not about you. And I go, what do you mean? What, what, what's that about? And she goes, well, this is about your potential customers, right? And at the moment, they're choosing your competitors over you. They see that, that competitors providing more value than you are. And really, that was what really smacked me in the face quite blatantly and shook me up for a couple of weeks that I was doing everything from my perspective that I thought this is the product they wanted. This is the service they wanted as a team internally with my staff is we'd, we'd workshop what we thought were the right things to do. And, and ultimately, it clearly isn't. So that was a real challenge for me is I needed to shift from what I thought they wanted to really what, what they want and what they need, what they 
really dream of. And, and look, I love Seth Godin um, and his, one of his books called This Is Marketing. He uh, really frames it in an amazing way that this is about who do you seek to serve, right? Who's, whose life do you seek to change? And then ultimately, what do they dream of, believe and want? Then how do you provide a service that's going to fulfill and marry up those two things? So it's not about how you fulfill everything for all people and do everything for all. And it's not the, the niche you can get with your target audiences, uh, the more successful you're going to be and the more ability then you have to empathise with them and really get to know them uh, so that you can fulfill exactly what they're looking for and and, and what they're not. So it's, I remember listening to a podcast about Air, Airbnb, right? In the, in the early days when they're um, trying to raise some, their first round of capital and they're talking to an investor and the investor goes to them, where are your customers? And they're obviously in Silicon Valley at the time being a, a tech startup and they've gone, oh, about 80% of our customers are in New York. And he goes, what are you doing here? What do you mean? And he goes, well, if your customers are in New York, you've got to be with your customers, right? You've got to... Um, <laughs> Slight exaggeration, but eat with them, live with them, get the ins and outs, watch them use your products, uh, get the feedback on the spot, find out what they really want uh, versus what they tell you that they want. So really, you know, how do you get really intimate with, with your target audience and, and really fulfill what they're looking for? There's a great book called Play Bigger. And one of the authors in there is a venture capitalist. Um, and part of his the pitch process that he takes every single potential investment through is he goes, Explain it to me like I'm five year old, the problem you're trying to solve, right? You're going to show my age here, but that movie Philadelphia with Denzel Washington, he's grilling the guy and the lawyer, and he goes, Explain it to me like I'm a two year old. And this is all about the pain. What's the problem that you're solving uh, for people's lives? It's not about an opportunity. It's not about the features. It's not about the benefits, right? This is ultimately business exists to solve a problem, right? So you want real clarity around what that problem is because that problem is the value that people are searching for, right? And that's what you want to build and how you want to build it. So, that first um, thing to kill uh, in my book is really that concept. It's not about you, right? This is all about them uh, and how you fulfill uh, the pains and challenges that, that, that they've got in their lives at the moment. Number two, this concept of imposter syndrome. I'm a member of EO Entrepreneurs Organization, which I love to death, which is really a group of business owners based in uh, obviously all the capitals, but it's in 50 something countries around the world as well. So it's really business owners getting together and just learning from each other, sharing experiences and ideas and, and what's worked and hasn't worked. So I was lucky enough to, there was an event we went to and it was 20 four of us then ranging business size ranging from a million million and a half up to a hundred men so some really smart switched on people in there really successful at what they do and we're watching the uh, tim ferris has got this ted talk where he's he, in simplest format talks about that one of his theories is that you, we all have our fears right and our fear is what's holding us back so the most important thing for us to do is to really face that biggest fear um, that we have and so for me at the time it, it was imposter syndrome right and then we went around the room of 24 of us and just shared our top two or three fears in life where and 22 out of the 24 what I could have thought were really successful people don't believe themselves to be successful. They, they have this fear that they're, they're not as good as they think they are, that, that people are better, that they don't have um, stories to tell and experiences to share. So it was just fascinating to watch that here's this group of amazing, what I thought of quite amazing people, don't think they are, right? And it's the same with every single one of us is, is we have this amazing gift that we a lot of us don't think we have, right? We've got 10, 15, 20 years of experience in, in a specific area that, in there is some superpowers that you may or may not have uncovered or defined that it's time to share it with the world. I think we've all seen this guy, Simon, Simon Sinek, I always can't pronounce his, his name properly. Um, and if you haven't, I'm not sure what rock you haven't, you've been under for the past 15 or 20 years, but uh, watch it if you haven't. If you watched it, you should watch it every three months. It's just, I think it's, an, it's a great reminder that ultimately this is all about your why. And the world of marketing is people buy your why. They're buying you and what you offer. Like whether you're a, a one-man band through to Commonwealth Bank, right? Business banker in whatever, you, you're going to buy that person, right? You're buying their experience, their skills, their enthusiasm, their passion. You're buying how they're going to help you get to where you want to go. So bringing that to the fore in, in terms of who you are as an individual Individual is vitally important uh, to, in, in the world of marketing and success through that. There's another guy called Derek Sivers, who I think quite a few of you um, would have heard of, actually. If you want to see an awesome two-minute video, just Google crazy dancing guy leadership lessons. Funniest two minutes of, of awesome to watch. But he introduced to me this concept of hell yes or no, which is really about your decision-making criteria and how you invest your time. And he goes, you know what? It's either hell yes 
or it's a no, right? So there's no middle ground. So if somebody asks you, do you want to come and do this with me? Then it's, it, it sounds awesome. It's a reaction is hell yes, go and do it. If your reaction is, I'm not sure, well, it sounds okay, then, then it should be a no. But it's really, how do you start to refine um, where you spend your time? And, and once again, marketing is no different, right? Is it, you know, How do you actually get to those one or two percenters that's going to make all the difference with, with what you do and how you do it? Um, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about picking the main thing, right? So it's not, you don't want to do all things for all people and, and try and be broad. It's, you know, what's that really niche pinpoint focus that, that you, you're going to work through? Um, it's this book, Essentialism, who David raves about as well, come across. It's, it's an amazing book in terms of, you know, just do less, but do it better and do more of it, which is really all about how, how do we awaken your area of authority, which is really your superpower. It differentiates who you are from your competitors and, and the next guy. It becomes a core weapon in your, your marketing arsenal, right? Because it makes you a true expert at what you do and how you do it. People trust and love a true expert. And that, that's it's, it's a fascinating thing that, and we've all done it, right? We've all been in conversations with people that are just so enthusiastic, excited, um, enthralled in what they do and how they do it. And that's contagious, right? You love that. You want to be around it. You want to buy from those sort of people. So it's really super important to define that. And I guess... Our, our two cents worth and by our one. Once again, after being in marketing for 18 years and seeing the ups and downs and seeing the, the evolution of the digital landscape is the future of marketing and, and specifically for, for the SME space and basically you're talking about up to probably 100 million um, in turnover is really this convergence of corporate brand, your personal brand and, and business marketing. And if I should have done a Venn diagram, but it's really the convergence of, of those three circles that there's really your future of marketing, right? So because ultimately people no longer trust companies, corporates. So that corporate branding is, is weaker. It's becoming less and less. So it's really, how do you find that middle ground of bringing all those three together that's really going to grow and blossom your business, right? And and your target audience loves it. Your current customers will love it and come back for more. Uh, ultimately, Google loves it too, right? So this is going to be the future of SEO is how you bring those three pieces together, um, which ultimately, number two, you've got to kill that imposter syndrome and stand up for who you are and what you do. And that, that comes to the fore through that sort of process. Number three, it's a bit small, isn't it? So let's just uh, make it a bit bigger. I guess... Number three for us is really killing what people believe marketing is overall. And I guess prior to G North, we had another digital marketing business called uh, Overdrive Digital that purely did Google Ads and SEO. So up in the top right-hand corner here was just, it was purely that product specific sort of concept. And look, we're doing okay. We had the problem with the, when we started in, in June of 2015 was the problem that I faced and we continue to face was some businesses we got great results for, did awesomely well. There were some businesses that we mediocre to not really going anywhere and there are actually some businesses we're going backwards for and the fascinating thing was we're doing the exact same work for, for all of them yet some were responding a lot better than others and, and ultimately it was three months literally to the day after selling that business that this model started to come to fruition like by, by background i'm an engineer right this has made a lot more sense to me than the, the gray world of marketing but ultimately to do google ads or search and seo really well you need a really good website right you can't do they, you'll never perform well without a, a great website right and you can't have a great website without great content so really this this execution sort of concept needs to all work together but you actually can't do any of that properly without having the right marketing strategy in place which is what i was talking about before about target or value proposition and so on you can't do any of that without knowing exactly what's working and what's not working around this tracking and reporting you, you need to get better and better right so you need the right analysis improvement process etc and then what's the management framework so who's doing what? what's the software you're going to use what's the project management so really for us engineering has become uh, sorry marketing has become more engineering and science right because of the complexity as david mentioned like there's so many channels you need to be on how do you do them all what's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck right so this is really where you need to bring that science and engineering discipline uh, into the world of marketing, which really needs to be overlaid with this concept of uh, impute. So I'd never heard of this word until I was reading Apple history uh, book. There's a guy by the name of Mark McCaller who came to Apple as part of the first investment tranche. And he was really the co business coach, for want of a better word, or the, the general manager that came with that. And he bought, he bought three guiding principles to the business. And one of them was impute, which really means you People do judge a book by its cover. So this is about how every fa customer-facing aspect of your business needs to be great, right? So it's no longer okay to have a mediocre website or a good website because people are judging you. They're going to do a Google search, they're going to check out five websites and they're going to choose 10 websites, they're going to choose the best ones that look the best and resonate the best. So this is that you need to have ensure that every single touch point has a great face to the business. There's a, an Accenture study they did two years ago now that was really saying that 70% of people's decision-making process of purchase has already been made before they speak to anybody before they work in the door so it's really that you know what 
I've done my research, I've checked out your website, I've checked out your competitors, I've spoken to people, I've seen review sites. So 70% of my decision making is made before I actually engage with you. So this is that you need a great cover of your book, which is really that concept of, you know, great marketing makes a great business, right? Great marketing is really, it's your promise to the world. It's, it's what change are you going to make in people's lives? And then obviously you need to fulfill that, which is your great business, right? So your operations, your product, uh, your customer service, all of that needs to be marrying up to, to the promise you've made in that. And then once again, this is that flywheel that Jim Collins talks about is that a great business does great marketing automatically, right? So you're a great product, a great service, a great offering, it automatically provides that loyal customer base. It's the word of mouth. It's the, the growth that will come from just having a great business. So it's, it's really that flywheel uh, effect that comes through the, the process. So ultimately, for us, we're going too far. There's a guy called Cameron Henry. I came up with shared this, this formula that I look, I love it. It's so success is equal to focus times belief times energy, which, which ultimately you convert them into obviously decimal places. So 80% focus times 80% belief times 80% energy, 0.8 times 0.8 times 0.8 ends up about, I think it's 0.5 two, three, eight, something or other. And so that means your chances of success are only 50% if you've only got 80% in each of those areas. So ultimately, for, for, I, I love this concept of it's time to kill, right? So it's time to kill. It's not about you, right? This is about your, your target audience. And it was funny when I was putting this presentation together two weeks ago, I then came across this quote the next day when you're reading your book. It's amazing how your mind shifts into gear and, and aligns like that. It's we're not here to be right, right? We're here to be loved. So this is all about how you, how's your business here to be loved by your, by your customers? You've got to kill that imposter syndrome and let's share what your individual superpower is. Uh, it's a, for us, it's once again, it's a future of marketing. And it's time to do great marketing. It's not time to do mediocre or, or good. Uh, it's just not going to cut the mustard moving forward. Yeah, so I look, uh, that's it in a nutshell from me. My superpower, for want of a better word, is really how you apply the science, the systems thinking and approach to, to the often great world of marketing. So for us, it's really how do we take a business as if marketing isn't quite hitting the mark and then obviously re-engineer it so it is. So we're, just, we're throwing out this offer at the moment. So we've got a really good first engagement, three to four weeks, which really we grab your current marketing pull it apart, analyze and dig deep into exactly what's working, what's not working, explore what's possible, what you're missing, what are the really quick wins we can get in the boards and then piece it together into really that complete marketing system that's going to take your business to the next level. So our current cost to acquisition of, of a new client is two and a half grand. Um, so you could either pay Google two and a half grand to get a new client or we're happy to throw it out to you guys that, that we're happy to, to knock two and a half grand off that first engagement piece, which generally runs for between five and 10 grand, depending on the size and, and complexity of the business. And we're nearly at capacity. So um, we've only got two spots left in, in our whole business for, for new customers. So uh, we're throwing that out to you guys if there's interest. Otherwise, happy to have a chat, happy to help. If there's any questions, please, my contact details are there. Happy to chat through what's required. Awesome. Let's give Ben a nice uh, round of applause. I have a few questions. That crazy dancing leadership guy video, while Ashley's presenting, do you mind finding that URL and typing it into the chat box program? Absolutely. Yeah, I might do it towards the end. Otherwise, I might get distracted because it's pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So say that to last. The other thing is put your contact details into the chat box because for some people, those uh, slides were pretty hard to read. Look, for me, you mentioned something that I just wanted to quickly touch on is this imposter syndrome. And it's quite funny because most of us have it, but we don't realize we have it. And you'll only have it if you're growing. Because if you're in a place where you feel you're unqualified to be, that's because you're moving into a bigger space in your business. One of the things where it shows up for a lot is people are scared of getting in front of cameras. People are scared of doing videos. They don't want to be the front guy of their own business because they say, oh, I don't sound great. I don't look great, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, that is an opportunity that most people aren't jumping on. And when we talk about communication and you talk about the importance of your website, and for me, one of the most important things is to be authentic and to make sure that your website doesn't have generic stuff on it. It doesn't have uh, things like clip art. We pass clip art. People know it's clip art. They know it's not you on the front page. So you're better off getting some photos done, getting some videos done and being as authentic as possible. And only if you can overcome imposter syndrome is that possible. And it certainly makes your marketing more authentic. Look, I think that was awesome. What we're going to do is we're going to move into some breakout rooms because we want you guys to network because a lot of you guys are stuck at home and this is about as good as a networking opportunity as you're going to get. So we're going to put you into groups of six. And during uh, the eight minutes that we put you together, you've got two things to do. Number one is introduce yourself to the other people on the call. Here are what you do. But the other thing I'd like you to do is discuss what did you get out of Ben's presentation? So what were the takeaways? What resonated with you? What excited you? What are the things that you need to do differently as a result of what Ben had to say? So let's pop people into some groups. We do this in a very special way. We count to three. We take a deep breath and everyone needs to click the join button. 
if that shows up on your screen, to meet some new people. So on the count of three, one, two, three, deep breath. How, how did everyone go with the breakout, by the way? Uh, did you meet some new people? Thumbs up if you did. I hope you did. Uh, thumbs up if you learned something from someone else. Did you learn something from someone else during that breakout? It's fascinating. We, we never used to do breakouts. We used to just run the whole presentation and people would sit there like stun mullets for the whole time. And uh, we realized that socialization is missing in our economy right now. People are not talking to other people that they've never met because you can't. <laughs> and so we've actually found that this is one of the most valued things about what we're doing is connecting with people online. So by all means, if you meet someone during that chat and you want to chat with them privately through the chat box, feel free to. If you're comfortable connecting and reaching out with contact details, you can. These things are up to you. But uh, I will encourage you because uh, we're going to do another breakout like that after the next presenter to make sure that you guys actually get to talk to other people in business and find out what they think and where they're going. Um, but we had some great distinctions in our room. So I was pretty pumped to hear what the guys saw and what they thought about. And this whole thing about killing your current identity to become the future identity resonated with quite a number of people in that call saying, I need to embrace the person I need to be in the current environment in my current business. So on that, I'd love to introduce our next presenter. For some of you, can I just get a show of hands for who know, already knows Ashley al Sadi? There's gotta be a couple. All right, for those who don't, you're in for a treat because she's a weird person. She's very <laughs> unusual. And as you can see by her title, she is the cold calling queen. And she embraces this. I've known Ashley for many years. We talk about sales a lot in business. And a lot of people are scared of being seen as a salesperson. And so when we ask Ashley to present, we actually get her to share her experience about who she is, what she does, how she helps people, and how you can improve your relationship with being a salesperson, number one, and your conversion, number two. So let's give her a nice warm welcome and let's get her on the call. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you awesome. so much. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen green as we're talking. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, David. Yes, I am known by many as that crazy lady that does what most avoid or don't have time for, and that is cold calling. And I've actually made a career out of it. So for the last 10 years, I've been running my own lead generation or cold calling agency, which is called the Promo Donna. We, as it says there, we were founded in July of 2011. I have, I started in my bedroom calling and, you know, contacting all the companies I wanted to work with. And it quickly grew to a team of now six cold callers other than myself. We've worked for companies all around Australia, generating highly qualified sales leads and sales appointments. And we are that insane that we love doing over 50,000 hours of cold calling in our time as well. But aside from running the Promo Donna, I also have a real passion in coaching and training individuals in how to more effectively sell or prospect. And that's what led me to establish my own personal brand, which is ashleyelsardi.com to do exactly that. But enough about me and what I do. Let's talk about what I think you should be killing in your business to make it more successful. So it is a fantastic topic. And I had to think about, yeah, what do people need to kill to be more successful? And for me, it's sales complexity. So the reason for this, I believe that there is a perception that sales or selling has become very complex over the years. People are adopting new technologies. So there might be some of you sitting there going, oh, yeah, that person recommended a new CRM. And then they said I had to use this system for my funnel. And then I had to do this for my emails. There's all these new tech options that appear and it just gets a bit overwhelming. The other thing is we're introduced to all these new terminologies or lingo or catchphrases. We're thinking, God, it's sales. It's just becoming a bit complex. And we're also bombarded by information. But this is where I'm telling you to kill that complexity. So how do we do that? This is about bringing it back to basics. I will always believe, and David knows this, we always have conversations about this, in order to achieve cut through to our customers, especially right now, because it's like David said earlier, people are craving that human to human connection. They're craving those conversations. And that's what you need to do. Kill the complexity, bring it back to basics, and just focus on having great sales conversations. So what we were talking about, guys, I talked through this slide here, which was about killing sales complexity, because we're bombarded by information. We've got tech coming at us. We've got all this new lingo. 
I believe that you just need to bring it back to having great sales conversations. So what I'm actually going to do during my presentation today is show you exactly how to do that. So the first way in which I'm going to help you, and this is what I'm going to enable you to take away and hopefully immediately implement into these conversations, is a really clear sales process. Now, this is the reason I believe a lot of salespeople or business owners fear sales because they don't have a step-by-step -step process as to what to say and when to say it. So when my team and I are on the phone, this is the process that we use each and every time. So the first step in my sales process is preparation. So when it comes to preparation, it's actually two components. The first being sales is one of the biggest mindset games out there. It's probably why I love playing it. And I believe if you can't master your mindset, you won't get the results that you want. So these are my tips when it comes to preparing your mindset. The first is to write down goals for the sales session as if you've already achieved them. Now, it sounds simple, but a lot of people don't do it. But you need to write it down. And when I go into a sales session, I'll write, I generated three appointments for this client. And I'll write one, two, three down the page. Because it's a little bit like Ben spoke about in his first presentation. Your mind starts to filter for the results that it's going to create. So you need to write down those goals as if you've already achieved them. Also be aware of the energy that you're feeding down the phone or over Zoom. Have you brought your A game? Because I learned that the hard way. There was this one time in sales where I had a terrible morning. Everything was going wrong. I spilled coffee on myself. My car got bogged. I was late. Then I jumped on the phone and someone said, Ash, I would never buy from you. You don't sound like you're passionate. You don't sound like you want to be there. And I was shocked. But I learned that it was actually as a result of the energy of that morning that I'd brought into that session. So if you want to create results, get into a peak state, go for a run, meditate, whatever it might be. And last but not least, be aware of your voice and your body language on Zoom. Are you presenting as the kind of person that people would buy from? You can go a long way in modeling behavior to get the voice or the body language that you want. For example, for my voice, for cold calling, I often model it on news reporters. Ashley El Sadi, National 9 News. I speak down with downward inflections. And that's how I've got a great phone voice. It's from modeling. Oprah Winfrey did the same with Barbara Walters. She modeled and mimicked her body language to become a great reporter and the person she is today. So that's how we master our mindset. Now, the second part of preparation, I'm glad to say that Ben has covered quite a part of it because preparation, uh, the second component, is all about the what's in it for them. Making sure that your information, your products and services, you understand what your prospects want in relation to the issues and challenges that they face. Because this is often what people do when they sell, they just spruik how great they are. They never focus on their prospect. So what you want to do is write down a list of all the challenges and issues that people face that you help, and then that's what you talk about when you pick up the phone. So we've done that preparation. Once we've done the prep, we do an introduction, and this is the elevator pitch. So it's a very old salesy term, but the elevator pitch is integral. And you had a go at this earlier on in the breakout rooms. You had a minute to introduce yourself. Was it clear and concise? Was it unique and different? And did it include the what's in it for them? How do you help people? That's what you want to put together as a bit of a spiel as your elevator pitch maybe one or two sentences and make it with all of that, clear and concise, unique, different, the what's in it for them. As we move along, once we've done a great pitch to someone or a great introduction, we then ask great questions. Now, I'm going to give you a tip right now that if you take nothing away from my presentation but this, I'll still be happy. So make sure to note this down. In sales, the person who talks the most is losing the sale. Now, isn't that interesting? Because everybody thinks that they need to bombard people with information. 
It's like I said earlier about sales complexity. We're bombarded with information. People don't want that. They want to talk about themselves. So what you have to do as a salesperson is just do a great pitch and then ask great questions. And the tip I would give you here is ask open-ended questions. Don't ask, is this something you'd be interested in? Because it's a little white rabbit, they'll run away. <laughs> you want to ask something like, tell me a little bit more about your sales process. Tell me about the last time you generated leads. How did you do it? What were the results? Get people talking. We then move after questions to inevitably receiving some objections. And objections, I believe this is one of the main reasons people fear selling. They think, oh, people are going to object. They're rejecting me. But I'm here to tell you that I believe objections are actually a request for more information. So if you receive objections, I'm going to give you a couple of tips. The first is put the objection up front. Now, what do I mean by this? There might be a lot of you sitting there that think, I get this objection all the time. And it might be, I already have a provider because that's a common one. So we did that with a client. We had a signage company we worked with and they would always get, they were targeting major retailers. So these retailers would say, we've already got signage. We don't need that. We've got a provider. So I switched up the spiels as, hi, this is Ashley from XYZ Signage. We're a signage manufacturer and installer. Now, I understand as a major retailer, you would already have signage. But in our, it's our understanding that a lot of retailers will review or will get new signage from time to time. Tell us about your process when it comes to signage. And it completely flipped the results because people either had an immediate need and were open to talk about it or they told us when they were going to review. So putting the objection up front is fantastic. And the other two objection handling techniques I would recommend are one, clarifying. If someone gives you that price objection, is it really price or have they not seen the value in what you deliver? You need to clarify. Is it price or is there something else that I should know about? Or the third one can also be solution selling, which is, if you've got objections that come up regularly, just make sure you have the solution at hand to talk through. Last but not least, we have the close. So we've done our preparation. We've done a great spiel, asked questions, handled objections. We should come to the close inevitably. That's when we know we've done a great job at the promo donor. If someone says, where do we go to from here? What's the next step? That's the great close. But if you're not getting that, because a lot of people will say, oh, I'm scared to ask for the close, here are a quick few techniques to use. The first is that you should use the now or never close. Now, this is great if people ask for discounts or they're asking for something a little less or something of that nature. Say, look, that's my problem, but I would need you to sign today. Because if you can't lock them in then and there, they might ask for a discount a little later on down the process. So now or never is a great way to lock people in and create a sense of urgency. The other one is the assumptive close. Always talk to people as if you assume they're going to close with you. So an example of this is when the promo donor clients start, they run a workshop with me. So in a meeting, I would say, when we start our campaign, who will you be bringing to the workshop? And that gets them thinking that they're already working with me. So we've run through the fact that we've got this great sales process that you can use to have great conversations. We're now going to have a very quick look at some rapport building techniques that you can use in your sales conversations. Because again, we're bringing it back to, break, to basics. How can we instantly build rapport with people while we're having conversations? So very quickly, so NLP is something that I have studied. It's neuro-linguistics programming for those of you who don't know. And I'm a master NLP coach, but the main reason I did it was NLP is all about, a lot of it is about rapport building. And you can use certain techniques to connect with your prospects better than you ever have before. So when you're in conversation with someone and you've had that great process in place, the way to take it to the next level is to look at things like this, your tone. 
are you matching and mirroring people? Now, this sometimes gets people laughing because I say, if you're on the phone and you hear a man and he sounds very gruff, very slow and very low, you want to start talking the same. And they're like, I'm not going to start pretending that I sound exactly the same. Don't make it obvious. But you do need to slow down your pace and your pitch to match and mirror. The same goes for someone talking very fast and very high pitched. You want to do the same. The reason for this, people like people that are like themselves. There's the clincher. If you act like you are like someone, they'll instantly have rapport with you. Oh, this this person's like me. They understand me. So that's what you want to do, matching and mirroring. And last but not least, you've also got key words that you can play with or using your words. Um, You can use common experiences. These are things that will help you to build that rapport. I'll give you an example that right now, obviously, a lot of us are in lockdown. This is a common experience. I find that most of my Zoom meetings or my phone calls, it's the first thing we're talking about off the bat, having that common experience just to connect. You can also do things about talking about football, whatever it might be that brings in that rapport. And key words, when I highlight that, it's actually using the same words that people use. It's a little bit like the matching and mirroring. If someone says to me a same word over and over again, I'm going to regurgitate it back to them. So, Ashley, I'd love to use your services, but I'm concerned about the quality. We used a provider and the quality wasn't there. Look, John, I understand a lot of companies when they come to me, they're concerned about the quality. But this is how we ensure that quality is there. That's how you connect with people on a deeper level. So that's a bit of a crash course in NLP. I know I don't have a lot of time today, so that's all I can give you. But I really hope that this presentation has enabled you to look at killing the sales complexity, looking at how you can get back to basics and just have great conversations. You can implement that sales process and then hopefully get greater rapport with the NLP techniques. If you are wondering, is my sales process too complex? I would love to help you. So please reach out to me. I've got my address there, my email address, actually at thepromodonna.com. The other thing I'd love to offer is if you would love my slides, please put it in the chat box. Yes, Ash, I'd love the slides or yes to slides, whatever it might be. I can send those through and they might look a lot better than my presentation uh, style has been today. So (laughs) thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope you've got a lot out of it. And yeah, enjoy the rest of the session. Fantastic. Let's give Ashley a nice uh, round of applause. It's been awesome. Uh, Thanks so much for sharing all that information. Uh, Look, for me, I've, I've heard this presentation a number of times. Every time it reminds me of two things or three things. Today, it was the what's in it for me. And I think the two presenters have both said, you've got to stand in your client's shoes. You've got to understand what's going on in their minds right now, and you've got to meet them where they're at, right? And if you do this effectively, you will build rapport fast and you will get connection with people because they're craving connection right now. Uh, Knowing about that, we're actually uh, going to go into a breakout room. Uh, This time we're going to go into groups of five. So we're going to give you about seven minutes and one minute buffer. Please introduce yourself to some new people. I want you to do the introduction. I also want you to talk about what did you get out of Ashley's session. If there's something that resonates for both, please share that as well. And we'll see you back here in a few minutes. So on the count of three, one, two, and (gasps) what I want to do now is uh, I'm going to be going into my presentation and I'm going to talk about literally how do we, what do we have to kill in operation? Before we do, what I'd like you to do is into the chat box. I'd like everyone to just in the chat box, what have been your top takeaways so far? What have you learned from the people that have presented? What have you learned from the people you spoke to during the breaks? Into the chat box, what have been your distinctions? What have been your lessons so far? So I'll get you to do that while I do my intro. And let's get into the last part of the presentation. I'm not going to introduce myself directly. You know who I am. I am going to talk about the three essential steps to building a business that works without you. Well, my preferred topic is kill the chaos. Here's why. Okay. My experience is this. People come to us because they want to grow their business. People go to Ben because they want to grow their business. People go to Ashley because they want to grow their business. But here's the reality. Most people can't grow their business, right? Because they are running in chaos. And if you're running in chaos and you grow your business, you're going to grow the chaos, right? And my suggestion is don't do that, right? If you grow chaos, you will actually create a lot of stress and anxiety in your life and you will break it. 
So you'll end up spending a lot of money attempting to grow a business that's not scalable. And then you will end up in all sorts of strife. And then you will have this, I told you so syndrome, where you are thinking, I should have listened to my little voice about keeping small. Because who's had this experience? Can't find good people. Show of hands. Who's had this experience? If you want a job down properly, you have to do it yourself, right? No one does it as well as I do. These are all the words of the person who is stuck in chaos because I like to control everything that goes on in my business. I like to make sure everything is done to my quality and my standard, which means everything runs past me. That is the biggest self-limiting belief you will ever have. And that means you are in the middle of the business. And yes, you might have awesome quality, but you also are hamstrung because the day you don't go to work is the day that things start to take a nosedive. So we're gonna talk a bit about how do we get out of this scenario? There's three levels. There's three levels that I want you to think about when growing your business, okay? The first level is getting out of chaos. Now, why do we go into chaos in the first place? Because for most people who start their own business, they do everything. Who's guilty of doing everything in their business? Everything relies on me, yes. So you are decide, you, what, what you are actually doing is you are self-employed. And self-employed is awesome because it's the freedom of being your own boss, but it's also constricting because being self-employed means there's no guaranteed paycheck. So you're doing all the work and you're hoping there's money left over at the end of the year so that you can actually make a profit. Now, when we grow the business, you will get busier. If you are in the business, you will get busier. And there's nothing wrong with doing that at the start, but it is not sustainable. Because what also happens over a period of time is we get older and we get tired. And as long as we're stuck in the engine room of the business and we're trying to grow it, we're constantly busy. And we end up not having any breaks, not having any holidays and not really thinking about our exit. Once we get out of chaos and we move into control, then we can start to grow. Now, there's a couple of things when it comes to growth. And we've talked about one of them today, which is getting new clients. Give me a show of hands for those people who want some extra clients today. Awesome. What about those people who are terrified because they're near capacity and they're really busy? <laughs> okay. Growth has two parts to it. The first part is getting new clients, but the second part is delivering the service with the same level of quality or better, right? So you've got to get the clients and then you have to deliver the service because getting clients without the ability to deliver means that you won't collect the money. And having the ability to deliver, but not enough clients means that you're spending more money than you need to. So growth is about two flywheels. One is getting clients in and the other one is delivering service. And the final one, which very few people ever get to, is leveraging yourself out of the business. Leveraging yourself out of the business. Now, I'm going to talk about each one of these three areas in summary. And the first one I want to talk about is this idea of chaos to control. And to me, what you need to kill to move from chaos to control is three things, right? The first thing is the I'll be right mentality right? I live by day to day. You need to actually have a picture of the end. And when I talk about a picture of the end, what I'm referring to is you need to have some level of aspiration. You need to aspire. Now, I use the word aspire because I think you need to have a goal in your business and your goal should be bigger than what you are right now. And I will ask you a question and I want you to write this question down and you don't need to answer it today, but you need to come up with an answer over the next three months. And the question is, what will my business look like when it's finished? What will my business look like when it's finished? Please, if you haven't written this question down before, you need to write this question down. Because for most people, they have no... When I ask the question, they go, finished, I have just started. Or finished, I have lots of life in me. I don't intend to stop working until the day I can't work anymore. And they're justifying the fact that they don't know what they're building. Now, the reason I ask this question is you go to a builder and you ask them to build a house. And they say, you can't let, I can't start building until we have a plan that is ratified, legal, and signed off by the council that shows every detail of what I'm building. But we can start a business and run a business without no idea of what we're building. It's illegal to start a house without a finished plan, but it's not illegal to start a business. So finished can be one of three things in Australia. The first thing that most businesses end up as finished is they close their doors. 80% of businesses in Australia, when their business owner is finished, retiring, can't work anymore, can't be bothered anymore, it's not saleable. They literally close the door, sell the assets. Now, your assets could be your machinery, it could be your list, right? it could be your clients, but there is no goodwill value in that business. And that's fine. As long as that's what you're going to do, and that's your intention, because you're the expert in your field, that's what my business will look like when it's finished. The second option is to actually sell a business. 
Now, if you are a person, is anyone in this call interested in selling their business at some point in the future? Right, there's a few, there's a nod, there's a couple of hands up. Here's the questions you need to answer. How much for? How much do you want to sell it for? What date? When are you going to sell it? And who's buying? How much for? What date? And who's buying? Now, if you do not know the answers to those questions, assuming I'm going to sell my business when I'm sick and tired of working in it is very naive. Because anyone who's actually gone to sell a house, and if you're selling houses, now is a really good time because the prices are high. The thing you do when you sell a house is you spruce it up and you finish the garden and you finish that reno that you never finished because you are trying to get maximum value for your house. And sometimes when people do those final renovations, they fall back in love with the house. Has anyone ever had that experience? You fall back in love with the house once you do those one. Yeah. Now, if you go and build your business as if you're selling it, what you're doing is maximizing the value. And if you finish those things that you never got to because you were too busy, all of a sudden the business has an appeal to it because it has asset value. So I want you to think about if your idea is to sell in the future, it's fine. How much? Who to and when, okay? The last one is that you keep the business, but you stop working in the business, right? You literally run it under management. Who's, who's, who's interested in doing that one? There's gonna be a few of us, right? That's one of my favorites, right? Because if you build the business so that it doesn't depend on you anymore, a couple of side effects happen. The first one is that you don't feel stressed about having to go to work every day anymore, number one. Number two is it increases the value anyway. Because when I go to sell a business under management, I don't need to sell it to someone who's as good as I am. I can sell it to anybody because it's under management. And the third thing is that I'm building it like, rent, like the renovated house. I'm doing all the work to make sure that I don't need to be there, which means I actually start enjoying being a business owner because I'm not self-employed anymore. I'm actually an investor or an owner of a business. Does that make sense for everyone? So my very first thing to get you out of chaos is know what you're building. If you do not know what you're building, then how can you possibly ever finish, right? How can you possibly ever move towards that end game if you don't have a picture in your mind? And by the way, there is no right answer, right? Any one of those three options I gave you are good options, but be clear because you do build those businesses differently, okay? The three op options that I gave you are different formats of building. And if you don't know which one you're building to, you're just responding to what's happening on a day-by-day -day basis. So let's talk about the second thing that we need to do. So once we've decided what the destination is, what are we building? The second thing we need to do is we need to have some level of planning. So we need to have a plan. Okay. A goal without a plan is not very useful. Okay. And for those optimists in the room, yes, you can set goals and yes, you can write them on the board in front of you and stare at them every day. And you can hope that the universe provides. And that's awesome. But to me, the plan is the, where the rubber hits the road. Now, I'll give you the metaphor. Every one of us has this thing in our pockets called a mobile phone. And in the side of that mobile phone is a GPS. And it's one of the most powerful devices that we all carry around with us now because I don't need to know how to get somewhere anymore. I don't need to know. All I need to know is what is the destination. I whack it in the GPS and the GPS creates the plan. Now, the beauty of the GPS is if I miss the turnoff, it recalculates the plan. So I never have to think about which street should I take. The GPS takes care of all of it for me. Now, I want you to imagine that you have a business plan and that plan is going to take you to the objective we talked about and we now start using this as our way forward what it does is it allows us to decide whether we turn left or right at the end of the street because the plan tells us to so instead of waking up every morning and saying oh my god what am i going to do today the plan says turn left at the end of the street in 200 meters that's what your business plan should do for you and just as a reminder if i go to a builder and they use a plan to build my house how often do you think they look at that plan They'd be looking at that plan every single day. If they're building my house, I want them to look at the plan every single day because I don't want them to build it differently to what I specified. Now, if you're not looking at your business plan, either on a daily or a weekly basis, chances are it doesn't have the level of detail in it that is required for you to keep focused on what you should be doing to build your business. So when I say plan is not a noun, it's a verb, right? It's not the plan, the piece of paper that's important. It's the plan process or the planning process. And every single week of your life in business, you should be investing some time looking at the plan, adjusting the plan if you took a wrong turn, adjusting the plan because of COVID, whatever it is, right? And making sure that you have a clear next step. Now, if you don't have that clear next step, you're in big trouble, right? Because the last thing that we need to do is be accountable. And to be accountable means we need to measure. Now, the reason I put the word measure there is because 
when people tell me they're busy in business, when people tell me they're busy, they're not telling me anything. When I when people say they're busy, the next thing I say is, great, show me your P and L, your profit and loss. I want to see how profitable you are as a business. And all of a sudden, they'll back up. They go, oh, we're just in building mode. This and that, the other justification, justification. And to me, the numbers don't lie. So if you want to know whether you are clear on where you're going, whether your plan is working, you use statistics. One of the best things, and Ben talked about it, is marketing these days is 100% accountable. Every single click, every single page visit is measurable, and we know exactly how much we spend, and we have a thing called return on ad spend, return on investment, and we know that our marketing is working because it produces positive cash flow. And if it's not producing cash flow, positive cash flow, it's not working. It's as simple as that. I will suggest the same with your business, right? It's not about turnover. It's about leftover. Now, leftover is the bit that you get to keep at the end of every month. So we need to measure stuff in our business, right? We need to have these three things in place to get out of chaos. We need to aspire. So we need to have a goal that's bigger than where we are today. We need a plan, which is a step-by-step -step path that we can know exactly what to do next. And then we need to measure results. So we're not kidding ourselves about the future. We're actually looking at real data. Is this making sense for everyone? Thumbs up if you're with me. Awesome. Awesome. And we're going to move through a few more things pretty quickly, uh, mindful of time. And I want to talk about the definition of insanity. Right? One of my favorite uh, sayings on the planet is doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result is insane. Now, I'll give you the example, right? Some people, who's been in business over 10 years on this call? Can I guess you get a show of hands for those guys? Awesome. You don't need to stick up your hand for the next question, but people come to me and go, David, what can you teach me about business? I've been going for 20 years. And I say, is it 20 years of business experience or is it one year photocopied 20 times? Who knows what I mean by that one? You know, sometimes the definition of insanity is every year we go, it's going to be different this year. And then COVID happens. It's going to be different this year. It's bushfires. It's going to be different. And it's not. Now, that to me is insanity. So if your business is not growing year on year, then it's not standing still. It is dying, right? Business does not stand still. Business is either moving forward or moving backwards. And if you're not moving forward, and I don't really care about the economy, right? Because for most people that I meet, they've used this economic change as a leverage point within their business. So some of them, they're growing like there's no tomorrow. Others have pivoted. They've changed to doing things online or started an online shop. And the people who are in the direct coal face, so people who are in the personal services, restaurants, hairdressers, they're using this time to plan their next step, right? For those people who can't do the work of their business right now, you should be building your database, right? Because there's people out there that are sitting around that need a haircut, right? And at the end of this lockdown, they're going to get a haircut. Are they coming to you or are they going somewhere else? Can you charge a premium? A hundred percent, because the day that we come out of lockdown, there's going to be queues outside of every hairdresser for infinity. Take advantage of the current market environments. I'm not suggesting it's a good or bad environment. I'm suggesting that it is what you make. It's not is what it is. It is what you make it. So make the decision to actually take advantage of any opportunity, whether it's positive or negative in the market, work out how to make it work for your business. So let's talk about this next stage here, which is the growth stage. Now, I touched on the growth stage a little bit before, and we need to get out of chaos first. And for me, what that means is stop running around chasing your tail. Stop running around saying it'll be good after this and start thinking about what am I building here? Start thinking about what is my next step and start thinking about what am I measuring to make sure that my plan is working? Because if your plan isn't working, change it, okay? So let's talk about growth for a minute. There's three, there's three parts to the growth stage. Very simple, right? The first part of the growth stage is we need to have some marketing. There's no question in my mind that most people under market their businesses. They don't spend enough money on marketing. And the main reason they don't, there's two. The first reason is capacity, right? I'm scared that if my marketing works, I can't deal with the number of inquiries that I get. Um, and that's a time constraint. That's being in chaos. And the second reason they don't market is because they haven't worked out how to make marketing an investment instead of an expense. Okay. Now, if I ask you this question, and I'm curious, my question to you is, what is your marketing budget right now? Just into the chat box, if a couple of people can just type in, what is your current marketing budget? If I looked at this financial year, how much have you budgeted for marketing? Just roughly. What's your marketing budget? Let's get a few into the chat box. Uh, 5K, awesome. 200K a month, brilliant. Um, about 10 to 15%, awesome. 75K, fantastic. So 10 to 15K per annum, all right? Now, what I want you to think about is how did you derive this number? 
Okay, how did you derive this number? Because for the majority of people on this call, the way they derive this number is one of two ways. They look at their revenue and they use a percentage. And they use a percentage based on what the industry tells them they should be spending. But I want you to think about marketing slightly differently. And this is how I want you to think about it. Instead of being an expense, which is money going out, it's an investment, which means I want to see a return. And I want you to answer this question. If I could guarantee your marketing produced $2 of profit for every dollar you put into it, $2 of profit guaranteed for every dollar you put into it, would your number change? Would your number change? And hands up if your number would change. Okay, about half of us, right? Some of us saying, no, it's not gonna change because we've got capacity issues. But here's the thing, right? If you thought your number will change because of the guaranteed return, I'm gonna take you back to my comment on measurement, right? Because I know for a fact that good marketing campaign will yield better than $2 for every dollar. Ben talked about in his presentation, he knows his acquisition costs. He goes, it costs us two and a half grand to get a client. And rather than paying it to Google, I'd rather give it back to you. Now, unless you know how much you're paying to get a client, what's your current acquisition cost is, and that includes your time, by the way, it's not just the advertising spend, it's also the sales time. You can't make those decisions, okay? So you need to start thinking about what am I currently spending on marketing and sales? And how do I capture that so I know every month on month what my acquisition cost is? And so therefore I can look at not only my attract, but my convert strategy. And I can capture the cost, the true costs, which includes your time, your energy, your quoting time, your sales calls time, your networking time, everything into your acquisition. Because when you know how much you're spending currently on a client, first thing you'll do is you'll fall off your chair because it's way more than what you think it is, right? Once you assess it, it's just a number. You should never be thrown by a number because it's just a number, right? The next question is, how do I reduce it? And the way to reduce it is to actively focus on improving your marketing by trying different things, improving your sales process by trying different things, exactly what Ashley and Ben talked about, but doing it actively and consistently. Because my suggestion is that I, even from the numbers that I've seen, there's only one person that's spending a reasonable amount on marketing. And it says 2,000K a month. But I'm not sure if it's 2,000K or 2K per month. Right? That's for Bobby. But if it's 2,000K, that's awesome, right? <laughs> because uh, that's two million bucks. What we have here though, is that when people tell me these numbers, they're thinking about things as an expense, which means I'm gonna spend the least amount possible on, on an expense. Everyone with me on this? Now, if I got $2 for every dollar, you wouldn't say the least amount possible. You would say the most amount possible. You would say the most amount possible because possible is constrained by how much cash I have and possible is constrained by how much delivery mechanism I have, right? And that comes down to the last stage of growth, which is deliver. So we need to get them in, attract them. We need to convert them into sales. And then we need to be able to deliver the service so that we can get paid. Now, you cannot grow a business unless you have those three things, right? You cannot grow a business without those three things. And if you say, I've got an awesome product and all my customers love me, I just need some more customers, invest in the attract and convert. If you're saying I've got more stuff coming in than I have capacity to do, invest in the deliver and start to work out who, how can I systemize what I do how can I outsource some of what I do? How can I actually employ people to deliver the service that no one else can do but me right now? Because without that ability to scale, you are now hamstrung, which means I can't spend much money on marketing if I don't have any capacity, because if I get more leads than I can handle, that's a bad idea, right? That's a waste of money. On the same token, I can't employ people to deliver my service if I don't have enough business coming in the door, because who's paying their wages? It's coming out of my profitability. There's a level of balance required here between in the growth strategy to get attract, convert and deliver to all work together. So this making sense for everyone? Thumbs up if you're still with me. Awesome. I'm gonna to touch on the last one. Now I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the last one because before I go there, another one of my favorite quotes, Jim Rohn, many years ago, I read his book. And if anyone doesn't know who he is, you can Google him. He's, he's been dead for since 19, well, probably 10, 15 years now. But one of my favorite business philosophers, and he said this to me when I was 21 years old, I remember hearing this on one of his audio programs, never wish life were easier, wish you were better. Because we can't change the external circumstances. We can't change what goes on in our world. What we can change is how we react and how we think and how we process things and the decisions we make. So start working out, how do I become a better business owner? And part of it is starting to look at the numbers and use the numbers to make better decisions. I don't care if you're not making profit right now, what I do care is if you've got your head in the sand and you don't realize that you're not making profit. 
And especially for the guys who are smaller, if you're not paying yourself a wage, you are the cheapest resource in the business, which means it's cheaper to do it myself than to pay someone 25 bucks an hour to do it. I want you to think about the consequence of that. Because if you're billing your time out at $100 or $150 an hour, but you're sitting there doing the administration because I can't afford to pay anyone, you're actually now rele relegating yourself to the $25, $30 an hour work. So the question is, how do I become better? How do I get more confidence in my ability? How do I make sure I'm doing the right things? And one of the answers is to stop doing the wrong things. Okay, so don't wish life were easier, wish you were better. Let's go to the last one, the leverage at the top of the pyramid. When we talk about leverage, there's three things that need to happen here. Now, what, when I mention leverage, what I'm talking about is getting you out of the center of the universe, right? Because one of the hardest things that we face as business owners is when we try and transition from what's called self-employment to being a true business owner. Self-employment is a job. Don't forget that. Self-employment is a job. It's not a bad job. But it's not also a good job. It's a job. It's a risky job because self-employed people get paid to do the work, which means there's no holiday pays. There's no, there's no sick pay. There's no uh, long service leave. You get paid if you show up. And if you don't show up, you don't get paid. Now, I don't mind that as long as I call it what it is, self-employment, because it comes with risks. And if who's self-employed on the call today? Just get a quick show of hands for those self-employed. Awesome. So about half. It's a parking spot. It's a place where you stay for a little while, unless you want to just tamper in business, unless you just want to do something to keep yourself busy. If you want to become a business owner, you can't stay self-employed because self-employment is doing the work of the business. And if you aspire to sell your business in the future, if you aspire to put it under management, then it can't be centered around you. So when we talk about leverage, this is all about bringing people on board in your business. Now, the first thing I will give you is a brilliant book that I've read over Christmas. I can get this up here, which was called, all right, Who Not How. The book is called Who Not How. You can't see that. I'll try and let me just uh, get that in the place where you can see it. Joe, into the chat box, can you type in the book, Who Not How? Who Not How was written by Dan Sullivan, which is probably one of the most senior business coaches on the planet. And what he said is most people try and work out how to fix their business. They work out how to serve customers better. They work out how to sell. They work out how to market. And they try and do it all themselves. Now, the problem with doing everything yourself is you're destined to continue doing it. So I want you to think in terms of who can I get to do my marketing for me? Who can I get to do my sales for me? Who can I get to deliver my product or service? Because when you find the right people, the who's, you have scale within your business you can leverage. So think about who, don't think about how. Now, when we talk about who, most people, unless you're in recruitment, I know at least one person, Bobby's a recruiter, awesome. If you need people, go see Bobby, right? But for me, business is about finding and keeping good people, right? You find the right people, you get the right people on the bus, your business will grow. You find the wrong people and you put the wrong people on the bus and you will curse the day that you started employing. And I know some people on this call have had this experience. I've employed people. It was a nightmare. I was better off when I was one man in a van doing it myself. Now, that is just admitting that you don't understand how to build a team. But what I will suggest to you is we live in a world where there's people out there that are looking for work. And I think one of the obligations a business owner has is to actually scale and create work for those people who don't want to run a business. Because there are people that just love doing their job and they need somewhere to plug in, get paid. I'm not a fan of corporate work because I think corporations, and this is a general statement, right? Don't take this to heart. Most corporations will say, yes, it's a 40 hour a week job and here's your paycheck, but their expectation is you work more than 40 hours. I used to be in the corporate place, right? And so when we run a business and I don't ever want to get people coming into my business saying, I'm going to pay you for 40, but I expect you to work 60. I'm going to pay you for 40, but I expect you to be good at your job. Okay. And do what I expect within the time frame allocated, not spend late nights in the office. I don't want you spending late nights in the office. I want you having a life outside the office. I want you to come back tomorrow recharged and really willing to do your job. So there's three things that we need to do to make sure we can leverage our business. The first one is that we need to define So we need to define the roles within our business. Don't employ people until you know exactly who you're looking for. So defining them means what is the job that I want them to do? A KP, what we call a KRA, key result area. What do I want them to do? And the second thing I need to identify is how do I know they're doing their job? 
KPIs, key performance indicators. How do I know they're doing their jobs? Now, I need you to do that for every single function within your business that you are considering to outsource. And technically, that should be every single function within your business. But start with the short end of the stick. What are the things that are currently dragging you back into the business? And it could be admin, it could be operations, it could be finances, it could be marketing. What are the things that you need to outsource right now? And even if you pay someone like Ashley or if you pay someone like Ben, I would still define what my expectation is. Because for me, I need to know what my return on investment is for every dollar I spend in my business. The second thing that we need to do is we need to recruit. Okay, we need to recruit. And, and this is literally going to market and finding people. And where do you find them? They're everywhere. And if you cannot find good people out there, if you're saying good people are hard to find, you're probably either not looking in the right places or your business is not attractive enough for those good people to work for you. So I'd be working on how do I become an employer of choice? How do I make sure that the best in the industry want to work for me? And so when we go into recruitment mode, it's also about making sure that I have a business that people want to work for, okay? And the last thing that we need to do here is we need to train. And this is where I think most people come unstuck. They employ people, they have an expectation that they can do their job and they don't train them. And the reason they don't train them is they say it costs money to train them. And here's my favorite saying of all time when people say, what happens if I train them and they leave? And my suggestion is what happens if you don't train them and they stay? What I think you need to be thinking about is my job as a business owner is to find and keep good people, which means I need to define their role. I need to recruit good people and I need to train them so that they are super productive and they love coming to work and they produce a profit for the organization. Now, if we can get those three things done, what we end up doing is we build a business that actually has some leverage. So we've gone through a lot today. We've had a lot of insight from the other presenters and I know it's a lot to take in and I don't expect you to take everything in, but I do expect you to recognize what resonates with you, what's missing for you, all right? And identifying at least one or two key elements because Bruce Lee is another favorite philosopher of mine, and this is on the wall in my office, right? Because often people say, David, there's nothing new. What you've shown us today, it's all, I've seen it all before. I go, 100%, you've seen it before. But show me the implementation in your business. Because if you're not applying the principles we're talking about, me telling you how to do them again is a great reminder, but it doesn't change anything, right? It's not the stuff, it's what you implement that will make the difference in your business, in your life, in your clients' lives, in everything you do. So it's not what you, what you implement. Just to sum everything up, you know, we talked about three levels. And we talked about the cars to control is really about having a clear picture of what we're building, having a plan on how to get there and measuring our results so we know if we're on track or not. Doing that gives us our time back. The second phase is the growth phase. And we talked about getting them in the door, finding new clients. And to me, marketing should be investment, which means as much as possible, not as little as possible. All right. It shouldn't be constrained by any percentages. It should be constrained by my capacity to deliver. And if I, delivery, if I have a delivery capacity issue, I need to fix that so that I can spend more on marketing. Is this making sense? Thumbs up if this makes sense to you. Right. This is probably the most critical element is marketing should be more. As long as it's producing a result and as long as you've got capacity to grow, you should be pushing the accelerator on your marketing. Okay. And the last part is the leverage, right? Because recognize the fact that we cannot do everything, right? I, I can't do everything in my business. And I'm not interested in doing everything in my business. I'm interested in, in building a business that employs people to do things. I'm interested in finding and keeping good people. I'm, I'm interested in making sure that they're getting value out of working with my organization. So I think you need to be thinking about these three elements. Now, how are we going for time? I must be getting close to my end. Joe, I will. There's two things that I want to talk about at the end of this. We have coaching programs. I don't want to talk too much about coaching programs today because I don't know who you are individually. And rather than doing a pitch, I'm not a fan of doing pitches. I'm a fan of saying we do have coaching programs. If you are interested in getting results in your business, we called Outcomes Business Group for a reason. And we don't work with people if we don't see results. Um, one program that we put together, it's a new program that we launched this year, is called the Results Program. And what we offer people is we guarantee that we're going to increase your profit or revenue, if you choose, by 8000 bucks in eight weeks. Now, I don't know if it's going to work for you right now, right? I don't know. But if that's something that appeals to you, if you're interested, who'd be interested in getting an extra 8K over the next eight weeks? Just a quick show of hands. Only three people, never mind for the rest of you, it's not enough, you want more than that. But if you're interested in this, what I'd suggest you do is one of two things. You either into the chat box, type in the word results. And what ha will happen is Joe, who works for me, just Joe on the call, wait Joe, so everyone knows who you are. 
If you're interested in learning how you can increase your profitability by 8K over the next eight weeks, I'm happy to have a 20 minute chat with you because I don't know if it's gonna work for you. And I'll tell you upfront, I'm an upfront person in case you haven't gathered that. I'm not gonna beat you around the bush. If I think we can help you, I will say so. If I think we can't help you, I will definitely say so. Because the last thing I need is for you to get to the end of your eight weeks and say, you didn't make me 8K giving you my money back because we do offer a money back guarantee on that program. Now, the reason we do it is try before you buy, right? I have to make an assessment. Can I work with you? If I think yes, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and say, let's go. If I think no, I'll say, I don't think it's going to work. And that way you have the opportunity to see what we do, see how we operate, see whether our system will work for you. I've shown you the framework today for what we use in our coaching programs. I'm hoping you got a lot of good value out of the presenters as well. So if you're interested in that, you can either reach out to Joe or you can type into the chat box results or else not. That's fine. I'm fine either way. What I do want to do is I know that the other presenters are on the call still and we've got a few more minutes left. So there's the crazy dancing guy. <laughs> Good on you, Ben. Don't click that link right now because what I want you to do is I don't, like, I don't like leaving the scene of a presentation like this without making sure that you have walked away with some valuable lessons. So going through your notes, I want you to identify what are the top three lessons that you got from today what are the top three lessons that you got from today? I want you to either write them down or put them into the chat box. What are the top three takeaways you've had out of today's session? The top three takeaways that you've had and what are the actions that you will take as a result of investing nearly two hours of your life with us this morning? What are the actions you will take? Because it's not about knowing, it's about executing. Okay, so into the chat box, please. What have been the top three lessons that you've got out of today's session? And what are the takeaways? What are the things that you would action as a result of today? Yes, we've got a couple. Great conversations, uh, look at plan every day. 100%, if you're not looking at your business plan daily, it's not compelling and it's probably not accurate. And so for those people who've got a business plan sitting in a folder collecting dust on the shelf, I would question the validity of that plan. And I've had some people say, I've got a business plan. I created it when I started five years ago. Go, How did that work? They go, I oh, know we've done everything on the plan. I said, well, the plan's finished. We need another business plan. What we're going to do is uh, we've got a few people. Alice Lynn said, focus, discipline, energy. Peter Sandor is asking a better question. Someone said to get out of my company. I kill the imposter syndrome thought, 100%. You need to get out there and you need to know that everybody else has the same thought process. Keep pushing uh, to working on the business more than working in it. Yes, read more books, 100%. You've already got about half a dozen recommendations out of today. If you need more, you can Google, you can go on our website. We've got a book recommendation. Be more decisive about what my hell yes are. Yeah, brilliant. Marketing focused. Great. We've got some really good feedback here. Complete business plan staying focused. I will ask, uh, Joe, can you just highlight the two presenters as well? If anyone's got any questions or comments or anything they'd like to either ask the presenters or share with the presenters, you could stick your hand up in the air or you could use the lovely little icon that makes your hand stick up or you could just ignore me altogether. But I'd like to see if anyone's got any questions. Now's your opportunity. Then partnerships drive growth, align with experts, create value. Next step, take team through my notes and use the framework exercise of reviewing our plan strategy. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Maria. Marketing should be more? Yes, 100%. As long as it's producing results. Bingo. Questioning in sales, making sure that you are not talking the most. And the last one you got there, connecting with the cause by matching a mirror. This is something that's been around forever, but people forget about it. And I will suggest if you have a choice between Zoom and telephone, take Zoom every day of the week because face-to-face -face on Zoom is still better than ear-to-ear -ear on a telephone. So if you have an opportunity to use Zoom as your primary source of communicate, form of communication, use it. It's like the communication breakdown, David. So what is it? 7% is words, 38% is tonality, 55% is physiology. So just like you said, if you can jump on a Zoom call, you've got extra ammo. Like without the physical presence, yes. you've only got words and tonality. So <laughs> Fantastic. So Ben, did you have anything that you'd like to just say in wrapping up? Is there anything in the comments that resonates with you that you wanted to touch on? Uh, no, I think it's, it's great that there's that shift of, I don't know if the shift of thought, of just that refreshment of it. it's not about you. I think that once again, that it's all about the customer, how you press their socks off. It's great really hard, especially when we're under pressure because we start thinking about ourselves. And I often say to people, if you're a salesperson and you're close to end of month and you start trying to close sales to reach your target, your clients will start to sort of sense a change in your tonality because it's not about them anymore, it's about you. Right. So people who are a plot, who, who are in a pressure situation in their business will revert to thinking about themselves over their clients and you will seem desperate and you will not make sales. Right. The best thing to do is constantly remind yourself it's always about the client. 
totally. Because clients it's, give you money because they see value in what you do. Oh, yes. I was just going to say, isn't it like for people watching and listening, it's a bit like if you say went out with someone or even a date is a good analogy and that person doesn't stop talking about themselves and you walk away from it going, oh, that person, that's what it's like in sales. If you talk the whole time about yourself, that's why prospects don't buy. (laughs) Fantastic. Fantastic. Look, doesn't sound like there's too many questions. There's some great lessons. Now, if anyone would like slides from any of the presentations into the chat box, if you type in slides and the name of the presenter that you want them from, or all, if you want them all, we're quite happy to send the slides out to you. No problem with that. It's really like today is for some of you, an introduction. You may not have met some of these other presenters before, so you get to meet them for the first time. It's about seeing if there's anybody in this call that is worth having a conversation with or reaching out to and doing an introduction saying, maybe not now, but in the future, there might be some benefit in building that connection. Even during the breakouts, I hope you met some new people and there were some connections made. We are mindful of time. We've got about 12 minutes to go, but we are going to finish early because I'd like you guys to go and have a bit of a pee break and a coffee break or whatever you want to call it. But uh, if anyone wants slides, just into the chat box right now. I want to thank you for your time and your attention. And also, if you can give the two presenters a nice warm round of applause for their efforts today.